to get started. We are from proteins to phenotypes, our last chapter started in the DNA and ended with proteins. In this chapter, we're moving a little, little bit more in detail from proteins to phenotypes and how those proteins translate to what you can see on the outside. So proteins are essential components of all biological structures and processes. They impact cell structure, metabolic reactions, hormonal responses, cell to cell signaling systems, gene expression, and participate in the immune system. We would not survive without proteins. DNA mutations can result in a non-functional or partially functional protein. It can result in no phenotypic change at all because of the redundancy of the genetic code. Or it can result in death to the organism. Phenotypes are the visible end product of a chain of events that started with transcription and translation. I so said last chapter, we went through transcription and translation. The DNA gets transcribed into RNA and the RNA gets translated into a protein. Now that we have that protein, what do we do with it? Or what does our body do with it? Many proteins in the body act as enzymes. These molecules catalyze biochemical reactions and convert substrate molecules into products. In the cell, enzymatic reactions are interconnected to form chains of reactions called metabolic pathways. So it's not just one thing happening inside of our bodies. It's a domino effect. One thing happens, then another thing, then another thing, then another thing. We call those metabolic pathways. And the sum of all the biochemical reactions going on in a cell is called our metabolism. So if you look at the two GIFs there, enzymes work basically in one of two ways. If you look at the left one, wait for it to restart. You have an enzyme and a substrate. The enzyme and the substrate come together in their active site and make a complex. And then something happens to the substrate. In this case, the substrate gets cut in half. And that happens over and over and over again in our bodies. On the right side, an enzyme can also take two substrates and glue them together. You get the enzyme substrate complex. The enzyme glues the two substrates together and in the end you get a product that is different from what you had in the beginning. When mutations stop the activity of a particular enzyme, all subsequent reactions in the pathway are shut down. So pathway A on the top, you have gene A makes enzyme A, which converts compound one to compound two. You have gene B makes enzyme B, which converts compound two to compound three. Gene C makes enzyme C, which will convert compound three to compound four. That's the normal pathway, that's the way things are supposed to happen inside your bodies. But at the bottom, if there's some kind of a mutation in gene B, that means enzyme B doesn't get made. Compound two doesn't get converted into compound three and nothing happens after that point. And compound three and four could be really important. In the early, early years of the 20th century, Sir Archibald Garrod pr proposed that some human genetic disorders had abnormality, abnormalities of metabolism are related. He concluded that people with certain disorders each carried a mutation that resulted in an enzyme defect that prevented them from carrying out a specific biochemical reaction. He called such disorders inborn errors of metabolism. From his work on families with these disorders, he concluded that those traits were inherited. In 
and they are, a lot of diseases or disorders are inherited. Mutations that eliminate or alter the activity of an enzyme can cause phenotypic effects in several ways. The substrate for the blocked reaction may build up and reach toxic levels, causing an abnormal phenotype. The enzyme may control a reaction that produces a molecule needed from, for some cellular function. If this product is not made, the mutant phenotype may result. And mutations that affect enzymes can produce a wide range of phenotypes, ranging from inconsequential, meaning it doesn't matter, maybe we didn't need that anyways, to lethal, meaning we die if we don't have this enzyme. Sometimes not having a certain enzyme is just a mild nuisance, like lactase. If people can't make lactase, they're lactose intolerant, and they can't really drink milk or have dairy products of any kind without side effects. That's just kind of a minor irritation. That's, that's not gonna kill you. To make the proteins required to maintain life, our cells need a supply of 20 amino acids found in proteins. Remember we talked about how our bodies make half and then we have to get the other half from our food. Phenylalanine is one of those essential amino acids. Our metabolism for phenylalanine starts with the conversion of phenylalanine to tyrosine, which is just another different amino acid. And the first step is catalyzed by an enzyme called phenylalanine hydroxylase or PAH for short. So metabolism of phenylalanine is a pathway. We have a gene that codes for an enzyme and that enzyme converts substance one to substance two. So the gene codes for the enzyme PAH. PAH converts phenylalanine to tyrosine. Step one in our metabolism pathway. Most individuals with PKU, PKU is short for phenylketonuria. So people have this disorder. They have a mutation in the PAH gene. So the enzyme does not get made. And they cannot turn phenylalanine into tyrosine. Instead, phenylalanine gets converted into phenylpyruvic acid. This acid will build up in the body in the blood, in the tissues, and cause damage to developing newborn brains. So this is the normal pathway in the middle. That's what's supposed to happen in your bodies. You have a dietary protein, meaning you eat that protein that has phenylalanine in it. It's supposed to be converted to tyrosine, which is then supposed to be converted into hydroxyphenylpyruvic acid that gets converted to homogenistic acid that gets converted to mainly lactoacetic acid. That is the normal pathway that all of our bodies take because I don't think anyone in here has PKU. But at each step, a certain enzyme needs to be made. And if an enzyme doesn't get made, there's a step in this pathway that doesn't get taken. 
and depending on which enzyme it is, will determine the disorder. So phenylalanine doesn't get turned into tyrosine, that person has PKU. If tyrosine doesn't get turned into the next step, that person has tyrosinemia, tyrosinemia too. So each of these pathways, each of these steps in the pathway has its own enzyme that gets made by one of our genes. So if a mutation happens in any one of these genes, the person can end up with any one of these disorders. Newborns in the US are routinely screened for PKU. Embryos are fine in utero while they're in their mother because the mother has enough PAH to metabolize protein for both of them. But once the baby is born, that's when they start to notice signs. Affected individuals can be treated with a low phenylalanine diet, which has to be lifelong, to prevent intellectual disabilities. And this can be difficult because phenylalanine is found in most protein sources and our body actually does need protein. So all of the foods on the outside of the circle are high in phenylalanine and should be avoided in people with PKU. So if you look at that gray circle on the outside, milk, beans, chicken, nuts, hamburger, peanut butter, cheese, eggs, pork chops, steak, all the stuff most people eat on a regular basis all have phenylalanine in it. But if a person has PKU, they can't eat that stuff because their body doesn't process it. Women with PKU are homozygous recessive. They have two recessive alleles for this disorder. They may have unaffected children. If the person they have, they've chosen to have children with is homozygous dominant. However, the low phenylalanine diet must be maintained to avoid damage to the nervous system of the developing fetus. So women with this disorder could have children, could have normal children, as long as they keep on their diet and their partner doesn't have it. There are mutations that block enzymatic reactions and other steps that lead in the phenylalanine pathway. So genetic goitrous cretinism is a defect of certain thyroid hormones. Alkaptonuria is a buildup of the homogenistic acid, which is one of the last steps in that pathway. There's tyrosinemia two, neonatal tyrosinemia, albinism. They're all different disorders that can develop if something is wrong with that pathway. If just one enzyme doesn't get made along that big, long 10 step process. And this isn't something you think about, but it's something that happens in your body every time you basically eat meat. Your body has to process that meat. It has to turn the phenylalanine in there into tyrosine and take all the rest of those 10 steps. And your body does this for you, so you should think it. We eat other foods besides proteins and each molecule has its own metabolic pathway in our bodies. Carbohydrates is another big one. Carbohydrates can be monosaccharides, those single sugars, glucose, fructose, and galactose. It can be disaccharides, Di meaning two, so two of those single sugars are put together. Sucrose is a big one. That's the table sugar that we all have in our house. Maltose is the sugar in beer. Lactose is the sugar in milk. 
polysaccharides is what we eat when we eat like potatoes. There's also glycogen in animals, so they have some protein, starches and plants. Mutations in gene coding enzymes involved in a carbohydrate metabolism or synthesis can lead to abnormal phenotypes, just like mutations in the protein pathway could. An autosomal, galactosemia is an autosomal recessively inherited disorder caused by the inability to break down galactose. Galactose is one of the two sugars found in lactose, which is the milk sugar in milk and dairy and cheese and yogurt. One in every 57,000 births has this, has this disorder, which makes it fairly common caused by mutations in the gene that encodes the enzyme galactose 1-phosphate uridyl transferase, which we call GALT for short. And then in the picture, you have a galactose molecule and a glucose molecule, bond them together, you get lactose. Your body, once you drink milk or eat cheese, breaks that double sugar back down into galactose and glucose. And our bodies have to process those. So people with dis this disorder cannot process galactose because they don't have the enzyme GALT. So this is the normal pathway. Lactose gets split into galactose and glucose. Galactose gets converted into galactose 1-phosphate. That gets converted into UDP galactose. That is the pathway with several steps. As with PKU, homogenous recessive individuals with a heterozygous mother are unaffected before birth, but begin showing symptoms of dehydration and loss of appetite a few days after birth. This disease can be detected in newborns. Screening programs in many states test all newborns for galactosemia. Notice it says many states, not all states test for this. Later, the infants can develop jaundice, cataracts, and intellectual disabilities. Severely affected individuals die within a few months, but mild cases may remain undiagnosed for many years. A galactose-free diet and the use of galactose and lactose-free foods can lead to a re reversal of symptoms. However, unless treatment is started a few days after birth, intellectual disability cannot be prevented. That's why it's always good to screen for it. Unlike PKU, a lifetime dietary treatment for galactosemia does not prevent long-term compl complications. So just because you catch it early and you started lactose-free diet, doesn't mean in the long term when you're an adult, you won't have issues. Sometimes it's not caught till people are adults. Many people on a galactose restricted diet develop problems in adulthood, difficulties with balance, impaired motor skills, including problems with handwriting. Like the ABO blood type, galactosemia is an example of a multiple allele system. You have the normal allele G, the recessive allele, the recessive mutant allele, small g, 
There's a third allele known as GD, which is named after the city it was found in. The protein encoded by the GD allele is partially active. Homozygotes have a 50% normal enzyme activity. So they produce some enzyme, they just don't produce the full amount. The existence of three alleles produces six possible genotypic combinations and enzymatic activities that range from 100% to zero. So if you normal, you have both big Gs, you make the enzyme, you eat whatever you want. If you're homozygous recessive, you have both small Gs, you don't make any of the enzyme, can't eat lactose. If you have the third one in any combination, it'll reduce the enzyme activity, like I said, to about 50%. So these people can have some lactose, they just can't overdo it. Because they do produce some enzyme to be able to break down the lactose, just not the full amount. Lactose intolerance. So like I said, lactose is a sugar found in milk. It's essential to newborns. Metabolism begins with breakdown into glucose and galactose, catalyzed by the enzyme lactase. Lactase activity is highest right after birth. And the activity decreases to less than 10% of newborn levels in older children and adults. Older children and adults don't need as much milk as babies do. So our enzyme activity goes down. Our body doesn't need to make that enzyme all the time since we're not drinking as much milk. So our body doesn't waste its time making something that we're not going to use. Individuals with low levels of lactase cannot digest the lactose in milk and dairy products. This is due to a variation in gene expression, not a genetic mutation. I said sometimes they can have 50% activity and eat some dairy products. They just can't overdo it. Hemoglobin is another protein that we use a lot, every second of every day. Variations in the amino acid content of hemoglobin was the first example of inherited variation in protein structure. People with sickle cell anemia have a mutant hem hemoglobin molecule. This was the first direct proof that mutations result in a change in amino acid sequence in proteins was also the first evidence that a change in a single nucleotide can cause a genetic disorder. Molecular organization of globin gene clusters give clues to gene evolution and regulation of gene expression. The adult form of hemoglobin called HPA is a composite of four protein molecules called globins. We talked about protein structure in the last chapter. You had your primary structure, which was just the amino acid sequence. Your secondary structure could be alpha helixes or beta pleated sheets. Your tertiary structure was how those helixes and sheets folded up, up on each other. And then your quaternary structure looked like this. Different polypeptide chains interacting in the different colors is each a different chain. So hemoglobin is composed of two alpha, glo glo alpha globins and two beta globins. 
alpha and beta, you've probably seen the little symbols. Alpha looks kind of like a cross between a little fish and an A. And then beta looks like a fancy B. These are the Greek letters and they're used a lot in science. Alpha is the Greek letter for A, beta is the Greek letter for B. And then in those molecules, you have those little yellow things. Those are your heme groups. So each molecule carries an iron containing heme group. In the lungs, oxygen enters red blood cells, binds to iron for transport to cells throughout the body. Each red blood cell contains about 280 million molecules of hemoglobin. And there's a lot of hemoglobin molecules. You can go through all those numbers if you want, but I don't need to read them all. So hemoglobin synthesis is one of the body's major metabolic processes. We need hemoglobin. Like I said, we breathe all the time. By breathing, we're bringing oxygen into our lungs, into our bloodstream. And the hemoglobin is the molecule that takes that oxygen and carries it around our body to the rest of our parts because all of our parts need oxygen. So hemoglobin synthesis is something that is necessary, that has to happen all the time. So that's what the heme group looks like. There's a lot of C's and H's, and then you got that iron in the middle. And there's two categories. There's hemoglobin variants caused by amino acid sequence changes in the globin proteins. Over 400 have been identified which have only a single amino acid substitution like sickle cell anemia. Another disorder category are called thalassemias. Those are imbalances in alpha and beta glob globins. So maybe you have three alpha and one beta or three beta and one alpha. You always want two and two. Sickle cell anemia has a huge pathway. A person with two mutated genes for the beta chains of hemoglobin produces abnormal hemoglobin. Red blood cells start to look like a sickle, like a little crescent moon. And there's a lot of different consequences that come with sickle cell anemia. So it's autosomal recessive and mutations in the blade of beta globin gene, causes hemoglobin molecules to stick together and form long fibers. These fibers distort and harden the red blood cell membrane, twisting it into a sickle shape. Causes anemia, pain, tissue damage, heart attacks, strokes, kidney failure. When the red blood cells are sickled like that, they get stuck really, really easy. So it'll cause blood clots. But blood clots in the wrong place when you get a blood clot in your heart, it leads to a heart attack. When you get a blood clot in your brain, it leads to a stroke. So you can't afford to get blood clots in random places because your cells aren't shaped correctly. Normal hemoglobin, you have your DNA, your RNA, your amino acid. In that sixth one, your DNA should say CTC, and most of yours does, unless somebody has sickle cell anemia that I just don't know about. The CTC in the DNA will pair with the GAG in the RNA and will eventually make glutamic acid. That's what GLU stands for. But hemoglobin in a sickle cell anemia, their DNA just has one mutation. Instead of CTC, their DNA says CAC. 
which turns that amino acid into valine. And that causes a whole bunch of problems. So just by changing that one letter in the millions of base pairs that you have, you end up with a potentially deadly disorder. Short-term treatments include medications, procedures to alleviate symptoms, pain relievers, blood transfusions, oxygen, because these people don't get enough oxygen to their tissues. However, since the discovery of gene switches, that's what they've been working on. The anti-cancer drug hydroxyurea shuts off cell division, but as a side effect, it leads to elevated levels of fetal hemoglobin. And fetal hemoglobin was the hemoglobin that fetuses have when they're inside their mothers. Those are normal shaped hemoglobin molecules. So the higher level of fetal hemoglobin that we have, we switch that on, the more normal red blood cells we'll have. This drug reactivates the gamma genes, makes fetal hemoglobin appear in the red blood cells. Switching on a non-mutant member of the beta globin family raises the level of fetal hemoglobin, reduces the amount of hemoglobin carrying mutant beta globins. So more healthy blood and less sickled blood. This reduces the number of sickled red blood cells, relieving many symptoms. And other drugs, including sodium butyrate, also switch on the synthesis of fetal hemoglobin. So before, we can just treat the symptoms. Like I said, give this person oxygen, pain relievers. Now, scientists are going into the cells and actually trying to fix it from the inside out, turning on normal hemoglobin so there will be less mutant. Pharmacogenics is the study of variations that underlie the differences in individuals' responses to drugs. Not everybody responds to drugs and medication the same way. And then pharmacogenomics, the development of customized drugs for disease treatment that are tailored to an individual's genetic makeup. Personalized medicine is a huge field right now. That's what your ed puzzle is going to be on this week. Scientists first discovered genetic variations underlying a wide range of chemosensory differences among individuals. That's all your senses. People smell things differently. People taste things differently. That led them to discuss the differences in drug metabolism and the need to consider genotypes when selecting drugs and dosages for medical treatments. You probably know in your life people that have a higher tolerance for just Tylenol. Some people have to take four Tylenol to be able to relieve any pain instead of the regular two. That could have something to do with their genes. Taste, your taste, some of your taste buds are genetic. Some taste preferences are coded for in your DNA. As a byproduct of work on artificial sweeteners in the 1930s, workers at DuPont discovered that some people can't taste the chemical phenylthiocarbamide, or PTC for short. Others find it very bitter tasting. There's actually a test that we can run in class to test if you guys have the PTC molecule or not, or the PTC gene or not. So it's found that the ability to taste PTC depends on a single pair of alleles. And the genotypes TT, big T, big T, and big T, little t represent tasters. Whereas the genotype small t, small t, the homozygous recessive, are non-tasters. They can't taste this chemical very well.
The ability to taste PTC varies from population to population. In the United States, about 30% of adult white people are non-tasters, whereas only about 3% of black people are non-tasters. So most black, black people in the United States can taste PTC. PTC and PROP, which is another related compound, are found in kale, cabbage, broccoli, and Brussels sprouts, causing these vegetables to taste bitter to tasters and super tasters. These people can also taste capsaicin, which is found in chili peppers more intensely. So if you don't like spicy foods, it might be because of your genes. And these tasters actually prefer low fat foods because they can't taste that bitterness. Variations in the shape of the, shape of the receptor determine how well PTC and related compounds bind to the receptor and trigger a nerve impulse that the brain interprets as taste. So this is what your taste buds actually look like. You have a pore, you have a taste receptor cell, and then you have a nerve that will send the signal to your brain saying this tastes like this. Tasters can be divided into two groups. The homozygous dominant, big T, big T, are called super tasters. They taste things very intensely. They have intensely negative reactions to PTC and related compounds. Whereas if they're homozygous, one big T, one small T, they could probably stand the taste. It's not their favorite but they won't throw out a whole meal over it. The ability to smell is mediated by olfactory receptors. Proteins encoded by these genes are distributed on the surface cells of the nose and sinuses. So you have your DNA, the DNA codes for protein. Those proteins are distributed in your nose and sinuses. But there is gen genetic variation to smell. Yeah, pink flowers and red flowers, they're the same flower, they're just different colors. Scientists did a test and two thirds of people tested could smell the pink flowers, but not the red ones. And the rest were opposite. They could smell the red flowers, but not the pink ones. You're probably thinking, what does this have to do with medication? But it does. Genotype matters when talking about medication. This is how the scientists found it. They studied taste and smell and even hearing first. And I thought, okay, if there's a differences in the way these people taste and smell things, and it has to do with their genes, maybe other metabolic activity is controlled by their genes. Although the genetics of taste and smell may demonstrate that different genotypes may be responsible for our food preferences and the ability to smell flowers, genotypic variation also provides the genetic foundation for the wide range of reactions to therapeutic drugs. So when we talk about drugs in here, we're talking about actual medications for people who have diseases and disorders. Differences in drug responses can produce a range of phenotyp phenotypic responses, drug resistance, toxicity and side effects. Some people experience side effects really, really intensely. Development of cancer after prolonged exposure 
to certain medications. Our sensitivity is to anesthetics. When you have a surgery and you go under, those drugs are called anesthetics that put you to sleep. Some people respond really quickly. Some people, it takes a higher dosage to fall asleep. That could have something to do with their genetics. Many of the different drug responses people experience are genetically controlled. Some patients metabolize drugs more slowly than others, leading to drug levels in the body that are higher than intended, sometimes leading to toxic or even fatal effects. Others metabolize drugs rapidly and these individuals require higher doses for effective treatment. Succinylcholine, succinylcholine is a muscle relactant and a short acting anesthetic. About 60 years ago, it became clear that some people took hours rather than minutes to recover from equal doses of the drug. So they gave people equal doses of the drug. Some people recovered quickly, some people recovered very slowly. Normally the drug is rapidly inactivated by the enzyme serum cholinesterase. Those who take a long time to recover from the drug have a variant of the form of the enzyme pseudocholinesterase that inactivates the drug very slowly, prolonging the effect of the anesthetic. So these people will stay asleep much longer because their body doesn't process that drug as quickly as others. Allele variations in breast cancer therapies. Tamoxifen is a therapy, is a drug used to treat breast cancer. It's supposed to be converted to endotoxin by a CYP2D6 enzyme, that there's different genotypes to determine that enzyme's activity and the rate of conversion. Knowing how much activity a person produces will determine the proper dose and prognosis so they can get the right amount of drugs and they can recover more quickly. <clears throat> there is a chart, breast cancer recurrence over the rate of two years with different drugs. Ecogenetics is a study of how genetics is related to an individual's response to environmental substances. It's not always about your DNA. Sometimes it's about environmental stuff. Example, paratheon pesticide converted to the toxic metabolite, peroxin. Peroxin is inactivated by the enzyme peroxinase. You haven't noticed all the enzymes end in ASE. And different peroxinase alleles determine the rate of peroxin metabolism and therefore resistance or susceptibility to its toxic effects.
So we don't want pesticides to have an effect on us, but we do want them to have an effect on the pests we're trying to get rid of. And the pests, whether they're bugs or something else, could have alleles that make them resistant, meaning this pesticide doesn't work on them. All right, this is our last slide. So what do you guys think? Do we have any questions? I made a poll for the questions because I was asking you guys. Anybody have any questions? We got our Ed Puzzle for the week. You got a discussion about what you want to do with your life because we didn't have a whole lot to do this week. But the TED Talk on personalized medicine is really good. She has an accent, so make sure you use the closed captioning. All right, if you guys don't have any questions, feel free to go work on something. And I'll Thank see you, you guys later. Have a good day. Bye, Maria. Have a good day.